the presentation of one of the uh, seven, seven um, items, let's say, <laughs> from the various schools. And so uh, we're really delighted um, today to have this initiative that was brought to us by the uh, Irish Architects Benevolent Society, whose chair is Carol Pollard, who's with us uh, today. And um, they approached us to see whether, well, in fact, I think they approached Jennifer Boyer initially, but just to see whether um, this current Zoomcast, because it's shared by um, the schools, would be a good place uh, to um, launch an initiative that they're keen uh, to support, which is to uh, provide workshops for uh, the mental health and well-being, uh, specifically of students studying architecture and related fields, uh, which seemed uh, to us to be a really, really good idea. I mean, I'm conscious, of course, of how much uh, difficulty and stress there can be involved in this experience we're, we're all going through of teaching and learning remotely. Um, and so anything like this initiative would seem like a really, really welcome, um, something really, really welcome. Uh, so today, um, Carol is going to speak to us a little bit about that initiative. And then we're pleased to also have uh, Charlie Butler and Deirdre Neven from uh, a, a, a youth, a, a young, um, uh, I suppose, charity initiative called Tribe. They're going to talk a little bit about that uh, with Steph and some of the other current uh, team and then we're going to, the idea is also just to open up at that point uh, for questions. Um, I think in general it's fair to say that I think we may also have on the line I think people who were involved I know we have people from certainly most if not all of the schools and I think we also may have people who are involved in student welfare uh, <clears throat> in various institutions um, including UCD. I know it is an area where there is a lot of support actually in the universities and colleges um, there's 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 a good level of support but i think it's it there's always there can always be more and it's always great when there's something that's tar tailored to a specific uh, group or let's say culture within the university so um we may hear if possible from some of those people later as well and um we'll also obviously be giving you all the details that you need uh, to sign up to the workshops which are happening at least initially next week, there may be more. So Carol, um, I just introduced Carol. Carol is uh, um, a chair, as I say, of the IABS, also ex uh, previously president of the RAI, currently teaching in TU and also uh, doing a PhD uh, with us here in UCD. Uh, so she's kind of well-placed, I'd say, let's say to talk um, to us as students and teachers uh, in architecture. Um, so Carol, uh, thanks for joining us today. I'll hand over to you. And thanks to you and uh, thanks to everybody who's behind organising this uh, great event uh, on a, an ongoing basis current. I think it's a great idea and well done to everybody. Um, and I think it's wonderful that all the schools of architecture have, have uh, a place to all meet each other because too often I think in our training we're, we're kind of separated from each other and it's maybe only later in life when we get into the world of work that we meet people who would have been parallel to us all the way through in another school but we, our paths have never crossed until that point which which seems to be a little bit of a shame. So as Hugh says, I am chair of the Irish Architects Benevolence Society. And I know that's a very old fashioned name uh, for an organization. And I know it's certainly one that um, a lot of people in the architectural profession aren't really that familiar with. Um, and we have thought about changing the name quite a few times. We've, as a, there's 10 of us on the, on the committee, 10 directors that were a registered charity and we, we follow all the compliance for the, um, the Irish Charity Regulator. And it has come up occasionally that we should think about changing our name to make us more relevant to um, Ireland now and to um, people who might need our help. But um, in actual fact, benevolent is is really a lovely word in lots of ways. It it it's, it it is means well-meaning and kindly. And I think that kind of sums up really what we do. And and I don't can't think of a better word that would sum up what we do. Um. So what we do do is we provide support, assistance, moral support, financial support, um, a shoulder to lean on uh, for people in the architectural community who find themselves in crisis. Um, and the architectural community is, is, is a broad community. It's, it's everybody working in the fields of architecture, architectural technology. I'm delighted that the landscape architecture students are becoming involved in this initiative and, and we will hopefully um, develop a, a relationship um, in, the, in that, 
that field as well. And what we do is we, anybody who's working in that field or their families who hits a, a point of crisis in their lives that they can't cope, that they're basically blindsided um, by something uh, unexpected usually, or they are in a situation where they've lost their jobs or their practice has had to close for, for a number of reasons, um, or there's a sudden death and a family is left behind, um, or there's students who, who, whose third level education needs to be subsidized and supported. We row in. Um, and we help people either in the long term or we help them off on, uh, by paying one off stipends, one off sums of money just to get them through that particular dif difficult period. And more and more in recent years, I've been involved in the IBS since 2013. So um, over that the period of the last eight years or so, I've seen the profile change quite a bit. Um, for, uh, when I joined initially, um, it would have been a lot of kind of older people that would have we would have been helping widows of architects or uh, people who um, had to retire early from practice because of ill health and hadn't kind of prepared adequately in terms of pension and savings to do that, or um, or they, they was kind of the general profile. But now, um, in more recent years, we are helping architects and their and technologists in their thirties and their forties, um, people who have had a sudden illness or an accident, um, who are finding it difficult to manage. Um, um, we've had some very difficult situations uh, that people have had to cope with. So what we can do is we, we actually like to provide a little bit of moral support in those situations too, and, and just kind of rally around and help. And um, if you want to hear from, um, hear the stories of people that we've helped, you can, you can hear them on um, our LinkedIn page, our IBS account. If you, you go to the bio on that, you can tune in to recordings that we've made voiced by actors of people that we've helped. And that will kind of give you a sense of, of the job that we do. Anyway, we uh, one of the jobs of the directors is to raise money every year. And uh, our, the money that we raise goes towards funding our ongoing commitments. And every year we have commitments of between 70 and 80,000 euro to people that we help. And our fundraising events are a very important part of that. We also have savings and investments that, that we can we can dip into, but we prefer not to do that because we like to make sure that we have a nest egg there should a really difficult case or cases come along. So we have four main fundraising events every year, a benevolent breakfast, which is like a big coffee morning. We have a tennis competition, um, which we would love some of uh, the younger architects to get involved in, uh, as with the golf outing that we have in September. And then the last um, um, event that we have every year is an art raffle, usually at the RAI conference. But this year, because of COVID, or 2020 rather, we weren't able to hold the art raffle. So we decided we would hold an art auction instead. And that grew enormously in momentum um, where we opened the invitation to professional artists um, to join us and we paid them their commission. And also a lot of architects submitted work. And we had over 80 uh, people submit pieces of art. It was fantastic. We ran it online. Uh, De Beers Auction House came on board to help us with that. And we actually exceeded our 2020 fundraising budget, which kind of blew us away because we thought 2020 was going to be a disaster of a year for fundraising. So when we sat down in January at our board meeting and we looked at what we were going to do for this year, we decided we were going to proactively spend that money in an area that we felt would provide most good. And um, being a teacher in TU Dublin, as you said, I teach second year architecture in TU. I um, also, for more than 20 years, have taught professional practice diploma, which is architectural graduates studying to become on the Register of Architects. I've done that for a long time. And I also, I suppose, I'm kind of a student myself at the moment because I'm doing a PhD in UCD. Um, so I am acutely aware of the difficulties uh, that COVID has brought. Um, I mean, it's just terrible, really. I mean, architecture is hard enough anyway without throwing a pandemic into the mix. We all know that. So being at home, in your bedroom, you know, away from your friends, it, it's, it's really, really difficult. And I, I, I think that what the IBS want to do is we want in some way kind of throw out an, an arm of support to the students. So we've decided to run um, workshops, which are especially designed by a man called John Broderick, who has been a counsellor for third level students for over 20 years. He actually worked in DIT, which is now TUW. 
And those courses are going to be run like workshops. There'll be uh, 30 people in each workshop. We'll run as many as are needed. So the first two, as you said, start next week, but we will run more as, a, as they're needed. And there will be some interaction in them, um, a, a chance to meet other architects and to engage rather than just listening to somebody on Zoom for two hours. It, it's really going to be social interaction as well. I think that's really important. So that's what we're doing. Um, there will be information on that posted through this platform and um, through the RAI, through the IBS social media accounts and through all the schools of architecture, obviously, as well. So. Um, now we're going to listen to uh, hear um, two young people speak about their experiences with mental health and uh, and the charity that they founded. Um, and they, they will kind of talk to you a little bit more about that. And I think the message that um, is really important that the IBS are trying to get across in inviting tribe uh, to come along today is, is that please don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, there's always help there and we're hoping that this workshop will, will help people help themselves but also come looking for more help if they need it. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thanks very much, Carol. I suppose from here, I think it's it's I, from an architecture as an architecture student. I think it, it. I speak on behalf of most people. We really appreciate you doing this. It's certainly been a hard year, and coming up to like the anniversary of of learning from home and working from our bedrooms. I think, you know, I we've been feeling it all along, but I think it's it's good at least now that that we we can start having this conversation and stuff and. Yeah, I suppose beyond that, to, to open this discussion up uh, more about general mental health, I think, to invite Charlie and Deirdre in. So Char Charlie founded this charity called Tribe uh, after, um, I don't know, I might get you to introduce it. It was after after your experiences with, with mental health, etc. So you might you might just start out by introducing us to Tribe and why you set it yeah. up in your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Here. Well, thanks a million for having me. Um, for me, it's quite funny to be giving talks or to be invited on to speak about this topic when as short as three or four years ago was the first time I ever heard the word mental health and um, I set up Tribe in March of 2019 uh, but I suppose the story goes back uh, slightly further. I'm joined with Deirdre who works on Tribe with me and I'll let her kind of give her own story on what got her involved with Tribe and and what our kind of vision is with it. But I think it's important to lay some uh, foundation onto where Tribe came from, because I think it's gonna resonate quite a lot with students. Um, when I was in secondary school, um, I first heard the word mental health when Niall Breslin or Brezzy came in to speak when I was 18 years old. Prior to that, I had had my own mental health struggles. And unfortunately, I had actually been to the funerals of many teenagers and people in their early twenties who had died by suicide. And um, you would think that those series of events would go the reverse way where you would learn quite a lot about your mental health and how to proactively respond to issues you might be having. Um, but unfortunately, when, uh, it's only really happened in the last few years where awareness, education, tools to look after your, yourself um, and the fundraising aspect has, has really grown. So the story behind Tribe came from when I eventually went into college uh, with a guy who I was in school with, but I was wasn't really very close with um, and after getting very close friends with that person his name's Brian O'Mahony in college and um, we ended up opening up to each other about what we went through in school and the most of uh, the, the toughest part of that was realizing that I'd known him for over seven years we had brushed shoulders walking by each other every day um, and we realized at the age of 19 or 20 that how what we had gone through was was very very tough and in no other context or physical pain would you ever go through that um, and it was a lack of knowledge it was a lack of awareness and it was a lack of acceptance in society across the board and when we opened up to each other we were very two very normal very privileged confident young guys we realized that this was probably happening across thousands of uh, young people in ireland and um, and we started to tell our own story one of the things Brezzy said which stuck with me was um, unless you display vulnerability yourself, how can you accept those, uh, expect those around you to display vulnerability? And it's the greatest snowball effect with your mental health is if you can open up to a friend or a parent or anyone that you can create that snowball effect. And long story short, we can get into the, what Tribe does, but after those first few months of opening up about my own story and Brian's story and what we went through, the support was completely overwhelming. I was receiving hundreds of messages from people I didn't really know saying my brother, my cousin, my mom, 
basically everyone had a touch point that had gone through mental health difficulties, had sought help in privacy, um, or had lost someone to suicide. And once we realized that, we, re we recognized we needed to create something out of it. You would think that would give me quite a lot of solace that, oh, loads of people feel this way. It actually created a, a quite a growing frustration that how the hell in 2019 at the time can we have thousands and thousands of young people ill-equipped to grow up, ill-equipped to look after themselves uh, and lack the education, the resources uh, and the awareness to really to like er early intervention was our big thing uh, and look after themselves. So in March of 2019, we created a community or an initiative to raise as much awareness and funds as we could for at the initially it was Pieta House and then we became a partner of Jigsaw. So we set up with the mission to create as much awareness, education and fundraising from young people for young, for young people as we could. Um, and since then it's, it's really grown legs and we've grown our team and our real focus is third level education, which I suppose is why we're here today. And we can touch on that a bit more, but uh, that's a bit mm -hmm. of a bit of a pre preface to why we set it up. Yeah, that's, that's like, yeah, it's it, honestly the word I, I'd never actually heard of tribe uh, before this. I'm not going to lie, but I, I think look, looking at your website, I'm really sort of, um, I suppose I think it's, it's really important work that, that you guys are doing. Um, you know, like one of the one of the things that it says on your website is your, your one of your main missions is to to destigmatize the the or to start that conversation around mental health, get people talking about it, and I suppose you know destigmatize, get get it out of the or deconstruct this idea that that it's something that that can't be talked about. And I wonder how, how have you gone about doing that, and what, what's your experience been with that in in the year and a half that you've been set up. Deirdre, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, I was about to say I might jump in. Um, listen, thanks, Carol, you and Steph for having myself and Charlie on. Um, for starters, yeah, so it was, as Charlie was saying, we started off mainly fundraising. Now, this is before I was a, a part of the team of Tribe. I joined in January um, of last year, January 2020. And I remember myself, Charlie, Brian and um, Guy, who were we were the four in the team at the time, kind of sat down and decided what were we going to focus on for 2020. So we decided to focus on more around kind of education and more the kind of awareness campaign because I think this all destigmatizing mental health first people have to understand what mental health is and what that means for themselves so it really has to start at that kind of grassroots level and it really has to start from again an educational point of view so kind of creating content whether that be blogs infographics and um, releasing interviews with industry experts whatever that might be to help people understand their own mental health because when people become more comfortable with their own mental health then they might be more comfortable in sharing that with others. And as Charlie mentioned, that kind of snowball effect um, coming on from there. And we've had even more messages since then of people kind of engaging really well with their content and feeling like it really hits home from the, for them. And, you know, forming a connection to us and the content that we write, it's been, it's been fantastic. And that's kind of, I suppose, furthering us on our mission to destigmatizing mental health in Ireland. Yeah, mm. and I think, uh, as Deirdre said, the, the way that you do that is with your closest friend group. Uh, and that kind of seems silly because you can paint mental health as this broad brush stroke across Ireland. But for us and with Tribe, you'll notice that if we could impact one social circle, that's usually going to snowball. And um, anyone who's opened up about their own mental health will know that it's toughest is the first person you speak to. And um, I'm obviously Carol's son, if no one has linked the, <laughs> joined the dots there. But I had incredibly supportive parents my whole way through and yet it took me six or seven years to really recognize what I was going through. That wasn't from a lack of confidence in my parents. That was from a lack of awareness and understanding of what I was going through. I was incredibly into sports. So the idea of what physical pain threshold would you go through before you sought help? If I stubbed my toe, I'd be asking to go to the, the pharmacy to try and get it fixed. This idea that we would go through mental anguish to the level that we are having anxiety attacks or panic attacks or can't leave bed for low energy is completely insane. It is, uh, yeah. it is something so bereft from normality that like we, I couldn't quite understand that. So for us, in, to, in order to create a destigmatizing atmosphere in young people, you had to start with an education and an awareness at a really small and local level. Like if you're the role model for your best friend where he can open up to you, up to you about anything, that reverberates and grows and basically have that butterfly effect uh, with, with it, within social circles. And although we started small, we started having people come up to us on nights out or in college saying, one of my friends opened up to me for the first time. And when you, when, once you get that spark, 
suddenly de destigmatization is not what you're lo you're seeking. It's far more than that. It's like an empowerment through education that if anything happens in your life, like a global pandemic, you have the tools on how to deal with it individually because it's such an individual battle uh, that we face every day. And I think the pandemic has only heightened that. Yeah, that's, that's something I might ask about, actually, because I know, like Charity had mentioned, uh, Deirdre, you, you only came on in January this year, you said it yourself, or yeah. January last year, I should say, um, and which means like the majority of the time that you've been working with Tribe has been during the pandemic. So I might ask yeah. maybe even both of you, how, how, what have you noticed with regards to mental health and, and the conversation about mental health and the pandemic? Has anything changed with that regard? Absolutely. Without a doubt, it's definitely the conversation has gained more momentum and I think people are forced to focus on it in a way that they haven't been before. You know, if you kind of look at the lives that we've all been encouraged to lead before this, it's all about moving at a really fast pace and go, go, go and have as much on your plate as you can and really push yourselves forward. And then suddenly, what was it, the 13th or the 17th of March, we were also, no, stop that, stay at home, same four walls for, we weren't really given a timeline, what's it now, it's almost 12 months. And that's nothing that anyone's been trained to do. Suddenly people were isolated and lonely and you're, they may have been facing mental health difficulties before, but have then been magnified or people that maybe haven't noticed themselves struggling for their mental health. Suddenly we're kind of sitting in the present and sitting with their emotions and how they were feeling and kind of we're almost forced to, to deal with them. And so that definitely kind of, I suppose, amplified the conversation around mental health and what Tribe are looking to do is kind of build on that momentum and make sure that right once the social distancing guidelines or the restrictions that are currently in place are lifted whenever they are, hopefully soon, that the conversation around mental health doesn't die out because it's not, the, the problems aren't going to go away. That's still very much an issue that's kind of there in our society. And we need to make sure that that kind of remains in the spotlight and people continue continue to focus on that. So I suppose we just want to keep up that momentum and that understanding that people have towards mental health that has developed over the past 11, 12 months. Yeah. It's, yeah. Sorry, go, go ahead. On. Oh, no, I was just, just going to say, like, I, it's as a student in, in the system, I think something I've noticed over the last 12 months, like the general conversation about mental health, like on a national level, like we're saying, oh, it's important to look after yourself and stuff. But I think there's been massive shortcomings within the university system in that, like, you know, I, I think for a while, at least last March, there was a good period of two months where everything did stop for a lot of people, like a lot of people lost their jobs. And there was a lot of this sitting at home, staying on, on Netflix, like sitting on the couch, like that's you doing your bit. Whereas I feel like university students in a way and students in general, I know my sister's in secondary school and she had the same thing where it was just kind of like we kept going. We didn't we didn't have a break. We didn't have a transition period. It was like, OK, you wake up and you're starting to go to class on Zoom. There, there was no real sort of break or transition period. And I, I think the break over the summer, albeit necessary, kind of left us in a situation where, you know, I suppose they were preparing for, for um, the next semester and an entire semester of it. And I think last semester, all things considered went pretty well, but I think now we're kind of back in the situation where, you know, we're in the deep end again. If you look at, uh, if you look at the two cornerstones for change over the course of history, Empathy and urgency is what you need in order to actually make tangible change. And although there's two sides of the coin, yes, everyone's mental health difficulties has been heightened. Maybe they've been uncovered or maybe it's been accelerated due to the pandemic. But the urgency and empathy that has come out of that is what we're trying to grasp um, and not let go of. Um, so the reason why we're partnering with Jigsaw specifically is that because of this heightened empathy and emergency or and urgency towards young people I don't think you'll meet a single person in the country that is not feeling for young people at the moment and mm -hmm. what we are working with Jigsaw on is that Jigsaw are great for the 12 to 18 year old cohort they focus on early intervention and prevention um, and that's mainly for suicide prevention because it starts when you're young if you equip people with the tools 90 plus percent of suicides are preventable if you can get them at, at a young age and that's what Jigsaw focus on but where they lack is in third level education Sorry, sorry. I got, I, got a, I got a phone call which just completely uh, sent my laptop haywire. Uh, apologies about that. Um, maybe that was uh, Jigsaw trying to cut me off as I was about to go into their frailties. Um, but basically the main point that we're trying to make to Jigsaw is that the 17 to 25 year old cohort is when men have not matured yet. Um, I had that mistake where we mature later than women and even women themselves will go out of secondary school, they might be introduced to their first relationships, 
their first sexual encounters, their first um, alcohol, potentially drugs might come their way, their first pressure outside of home, moving out. If you think about the control you have in secondary school and how tough that is in itself, imagine being thrown into the deep end of all the accelerated maturity that is forced upon you and you have to just take. And the resources simply aren't there at the moment. And the great thing is, is like the IABS are doing now and like Jigsaw are doing now is bringing to the government a mandate and a, and a set of policies that is going to prioritize that 17 to 25 year old cohort. And really what we're trying to do at Tribe is be the youth voice driving that change. Too long has the mental health advocacy been people who are the professionals and the counselors and the people um, who haven't been through it in quite some time. So what we're trying to do is almost be the focus group or the ongoing focus group for Jigsaw to create policies that are grassroots that actually impact third level education and students in a, in, in a real way. Um, and that's our vision for the yeah. future is to try and be that, uh, support that change because you're right, um, the support hasn't been there. That's mm -hmm. it. And I mean, there was there some brilliant organizations like Jigsaw, like Pieta House that exist for people who are aware that they're struggling and are willing to kind of reach out and seek support to help them in, in their struggles, I suppose. But there isn't a structured approach towards people maintaining their mental health and understanding their mental health and understanding their emotional world and kind of being able to kind of recognize those pain points when they come in and recognize when they need help. You know, there needs to be intervention even earlier to kind of the mental health is at the core of everything that we do in our lives as a whole. So there needs to be a structured approach towards maintaining good mental health, not just repairing mental health when we are struggling. Yeah, I think there's actually there's, there's sort of like two aspects to that as well. Like on, on the one sense, there is the individual circumstances and, and the individuals needing to look after themselves. But I think one of the things that, that's not necessarily being addressed, and it's no fault of, of anybody at the moment, is, is the fact that there are certain systemic issues with, with how our education is structured. Like I know, particularly within architecture, I know neither of you are from the architecture community, but I, I've certainly in conversations with my close friends, my own experience, I know Carol mentioned the other day as well, that architecture students tend to be affected much worse um, with mental health issues that, than a lot of other students. And like, when you're looking at statistics like that, you really have to question, is there actually an issue with our education system? Like, is it, it's not just necessarily, we're not talking about mental health, we're not looking after ourselves, but sometimes we're not given the circumstances where we're able to actually look after ourselves, like we're, we're physically unable to look after ourselves. Um, yeah, yeah 100%, I think that's probably maybe subdued creativity or not being able to be given the resources at the time to focus on what you care more about. And it, I, maybe I would not be in a position to speak, I'm sure Carol would be, but, that idea of supporting and nurturing uh, transcends industries and maybe it just architecture has fallen particularly hard um, in decades gone by and, and, and has maybe seen the most prevalence in, uh, when the pandemic hit because it has been hit more than other industries because of that nature. I know my mom talks about being in, in studio and the importance of being in studio like if you take that away from someone it's different to myself who might be in a business landscape where I can basically get my endorphins from online to a certain degree where you, you lack that so um it's just a really tough period for for the, the industry and i think holding hope and holding perseverance is going to stand to you when you when you get out the other end 100 percent, and i think it just kind of shows the importance of integrating mental health in all organizations and you know as, as good as it is to have a program kind of running linear to others you need to integrate them and you need the, everyone to work together and make sure that it's a core part of every single organization and every community that we're a part of because it does affect everyone and Steph like you mentioned some worse than others and you know so we need to work with with each other and with different communities to make sure mental health is at the heart of, of everything that we do. Mm -hmm, for sure I think I think as well like kind of what I what I said was like like I said, there, there's two different aspects to it. But the first aspect of almost like if you want to tackle systemic issues, you have to be in a healthy place. And, you know, knowing what supports are there is kind of like the, the first and probably most fundamental step. Like I know in my own experience, like actually trying to find a counsellor, it's incredibly hard. Like mm -hmm. it's it's not easy. It's it's not obvious. And it's like if you're in a situation, if you're in crisis, there's there's almost no way to to google your way it's like crawling through mud almost like there's no way also, to actually that's, that, that, that's the level of how to do it still is like yeah. you, you can you can see how far we've come if what four years ago was the first time i'd been even told about the word mental health 
And even still, the idea of seeking a counselor or seeking help still carries a stigma. Like we can't, like, yes, my social circle might be more progressive or I might have great friends and be incredibly lucky to have that where I would be able to say to them, but it wouldn't be without a pinch of maybe I shouldn't say that. Or it's still, and, and like I'm, I'm the founder of a mental health charity and I would still feel like you would still have that level of shame. So we're, there's still a long way to go. Like it, 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 that idea that the ease and simplicity in which you could get someone to help is still hard. You know, yeah. I don't think anyone would go down to their local pharmacy or their local counselor or you just don't do that so yeah. there's a lot of bridges that we still need to cross and uh, and i'd encourage everyone and uh, both young young uh, and people who have been been in the architectural community for for decades is is that you need to you need to start and you need to push because no one's going to push it for you like a lot of you the best thing that architecture students can do at the moment is be proactive and take action within that as i said empathy and urgency is what's going to drive change and that idea of like you said step you even saying that now and being open about that is a really important step because you've no idea the impact that those small decisions make in the long run mm -hmm. this idea that if you can encourage one person to do something today that they wouldn't have yesterday and you can do that enough times in enough forums like this it, you're bound to make that less and less to do until a point where our children and our, when our kids are in studying architecture in ucd or tud and that they'll laugh at us for this conversation. And that's where you want to be. Yeah, yeah for sure, for sure. Um, Hugh's just asked in the chat there, I don't know if you see that, but he's wondering oh, yeah. what the significance of the name Tribe, what, where did that come from? Why did you choose that? Yeah, um, so funnily enough, uh, Tribe came from what held myself and Brian together. Um, Brian, uh, again, was the, my, one of my best friends and who I set it up with. And when we talked about what we wanted this to represent, um, we talked about hope quite a lot um, for, for Brian when it got to a point when the next seeing the next day or the next week was, an, was a challenge um, you looked at what holds you together and one of his famous quotes is that um, deciding to end your own life doesn't take any pain away it just passes it on to those around you and when mm -hmm. you are in your really tough periods of your life you realise that those around you is what matters most um, and that tribe that you can rely on, that you can rely on when you're at your worst point and they're the first person you want to run to when you're at your highest point. Um, that cohort of people and that idea that you have people that you can lean on and you're not alone in whatever struggle that you're going through was what was most important to us. Um, and that idea of a, a tribe was something that is so deeply humane that we wanted to try and um, have that as our mantra, our, our philosophy, some sort of enduring strength uh, through it all. Absolutely. And it's, it's the idea that when you're you're, you're kind of at your worst, it's often difficult to remember who is there for you. So having an organization that reinforces the, the, the belief that there is people around you and there is wherever you look, there are people there to support you is something that I think is really key. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So what, what is going into the future then? How do you guys see yourself like post pandemic? You obviously want to keep the conversation around um, mental, health up, mental health up. So like, what, what are your plans for the future? What are your plans for going forward? Yeah, so we're really focused on third level. And um, we are working really hard on a, a student ambassador program across third level that we're working with Jigsaw. And we're working with an organization called Ohana, which is a suicide prevention service an educational uh, organization. Um, and we're working with the student counselors across UCD, uh, DCU and Trinity. And what we want to do is create a program for young people from young people. Um, mm -hmm. And what we wanted to do is because we recognize the power of having a friend be the person you can turn to or to show you the way, we wanted to create a, an ambassador role where people can be on the ground within universities as a touch point for Tribe. So that if you're really struggling the, the step of going to a counsellor or seeking help can be very daunting and we're trying to act as what ambassadors can be the stepping stone toward that. So in the very near term, we're doing a lot of work with um, organisations that can provide CBT training, which is cognitive behavioural therapy, with mindfulness training, with suicide prevention training. So it's just as, as important to be a really good friend as it is to know the tools to look after yourself, to recognise when someone might be struggling. And one of the key things that we're trying to do is build a program that we can employ in universities across Ireland that young people can upskill themselves and train themselves and gain the tools necessary to look after themselves and those around them. 
and, mm-hmm. and we're doing that with Jigsaw and we're hopefully going to try and influence policy on the government with Jigsaw as well. Um, I know we've had talks with Simon Harris through Jigsaw, um, who is obviously the Minister of uh, Third Level Education at the moment, um, on really trying to refine the resources and supports available and not just have it as a growing awareness trend. In, 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 the, in the, I suppose, the, the, the short term in the coming um, academic year, kind of in September, we're looking to roll out that programme throughout societies, kind of recognising that societies are a very important community in college is a huge support for people especially at the moment I mean that might be a lot of people's kind of only social outlet whether it be online or online at the moment so kind of introducing that program through societies and just my own experience I was a a chairperson of the dance society in UCD last year and um, I remember in, in a meeting with the FU at the beginning or the the society's council at the beginning of the year we were told we had to scrap welfare officers they said you can't have that term because you don't have the training there was no talk about providing that training so even that small uh, kind of focus on welfare on mental welfare was even still taken away so we think it's just really important to reintroduce that aspect into communities that are a huge support for college students uh, before the pandemic and especially now yeah and we yeah do. i think i w- i would say like that that is a really important thing because there, there's a certain aspect of like the societies where it's almost it can be almost therapeutic to escape like what you're studying and go and hang out with people who are, have similar interests and stuff like that and if there's almost if there's formal training there you can almost run it maybe not formally but like have the correct supports there so you can run it like a group therapy session almost but not call it group therapy it's just it's almost yeah. endemic that it's almost built in the fact that that's what it's about. It's about looking after yourself and being yeah. social and, and, and doing we're, things. We're, like- we're hoping we can be sufficient ourselves within that. So over the last, uh, whatever, almost two years, we've raised over 125,000 euros. So we have, we do fundraising events. We do our own fundraising and throughout the pandemic, we haven't let that stop. Uh, all of our money goes directly to Jigsaw currently. And we do have plans to set up as our own nonprofit um, and gain gain autonomy about where we put those resources um, and exactly what Deirdre was saying there that's hopefully where we can funnel supports directly into third level education um, and get rid of the those sort of titles like group therapy and counseling and, and make it more make it more every day and make it more get rid of that those chains that kind of have held us back before and um, so that's really mm-hmm. our goal is to try and formalize this and and get into uh, and stay as the youth voice within university even as I grow old yeah that's wonderful i'm i'm really really glad that you guys are that you guys are doing this and that we can we can host you and we can spread the word about this i'm, Thank you I'm so sure much. like you you guys have a, an instagram and, and uh, twitter and social medias that you might post into the chat to allow people to, yeah yeah to our, our, I'll, I'll, I'll throw in our uh, we, do everything. we yeah. do everything pretty much through instagram and um, and i'll just throw in our website as well um yeah. so our instagram is probably where you'll see most about us and um, we do fundraising, we do awareness, we do talks, we do a lot of content um, and hopefully post pandemic, there will be a lot more activity on it. So uh, feel free to get in touch with anything. I know these things can be tough to ask questions. Uh, so myself and Deirdre are always uh, a message away and you can get in touch with us through the page or us personally, we'd be more than happy to have a chat. Mm-hmm. I see there's, a, there's another question in the chat there from Owen McGuire. Uh, what, what is it uh, you need from students to keep the conversation going on mental health with, within their colleges? Is there a step that students can take to get, quote, the ball rolling? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So one of the key things is we're going to be looking for societies to join join us when we do take that leap in September. And um, spreading the word is is huge for that. And that, that ambassador program is basically going to be... Um, is going to survive on the uh, the input of societies. We want to be a almost a fulcrum that allows, or like a hub, and then the spoke is going to be all the societies that we can connect with and have a tribe ambassador uh, position within every society that can uh, host the educational programs and do everything. So in terms of getting the ball rolling and um, spreading the word is great, and also then getting buy in from your um, from your the societies that you're in within the architectural schools. Um, and also universities across Ireland. I know this is a wider reach than we currently have. So we'll be looking across Ireland uh, to the different universities to try and get this ambassador program in as many as possible and to get our presence in as many universities as possible. Um, mm-hmm. So that would be the goal in terms of getting the ball rolling. Yeah, and I mean, it's we've been very conscious. I know Charlie and Brian have since the beginning of Tribe and, and myself has been a huge point since I joined. Um, it's been very important to understand that we don't know everything by a long shot. We really, really don't. 
we've obviously invested in our own mental health and our education around it and it kind of leaned on the supports around us, but we definitely don't know anything. And so every program, every initiative that we create, we will need the input of everyone that we can get. And we want to create a program that is beneficial for everyone who will be using it, which won't be us because we won't be in colleges at the time. So we will definitely be looking for the input of people who've taken part in the program and people who are interested because we want to make it something that is reflective of the needs of people who will be taking part. So. Yeah, and also to understand the issues that face current 18 year olds. And um, I'm 23 now, you know, the gray hair is coming <laughs> on. So to stay relevant, and just I can it, see Carol laughing up there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's, it's the luscious locks that I've gotten from her. But um, we uh, across the universities to stay relevant year to year as we grow, we need to stay as connected as possible. And um, so that's why we're going to continue to do these talks, continue to stay connected and continue to have people uh, reaching out to us and, and understanding and listening to them. I think listening is going to be the most important thing going forward for us um, mm -hmm. as we can stay as relevant as we would like to be. That's wonderful. Listen, Deirdre and Charlie, thank you so thank much you for so much. Thanks so much for having us on. Introducing to us. Uh, I think I might hand back over to Carol just so uh, she can introduce the the workshops that are going to be on next Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Steph. And uh, thanks to Charlie and, and Deirdre for the wonderful uh, explanation of what the tribe does. And um, I think you're just your the idea of tribe. I mean, I, because I'm familiar with it, I hadn't really thought about it for a while. But um, I think uh, it kind of it's a nice kind of segue into what the IABS is in that in in a kind of a way we are a tribe for the architectural community. We're a little small tribe at the moment, but we are trying to grow it and 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 be more relevant and and, and create awareness. So if, if you ever are in trouble, don't forget that we're always here to help you. Um, and, and, and that's what we're there for. I think Deirdre said a tribe is, some, is a group of people who are there for you. And, and that really sums up what the IBS does. So, so, that, so that's a nice, a nice kind of a, a connection between um, what, what Charlie and, uh, and Deirdre do and what the IBS does. Um, so the courses, we've, we've, we've booked two courses to start with, and they're next Wednesday and Thursday, the 24th and 25th of February. And um, I think Steph's going to put up a slide now, which is a poster of how the booking works. Um, and the, we're very grateful to the RIAI, which is the Royal Institute of Architects of Ireland, because they're going to manage the booking system for us. We don't have the facilities to do that ourselves. OK, so this looks like a bit long, long winded, but I'm going to bring you straight down to the red text. So to take part in the in the workshops, I'm afraid booking is essential because we need to make them as relevant and um, as successful as we can. So we need to uh, control the numbers that attend uh, so that everybody gets the most out of it. So we're, we're going to have um, a limit of 30 people per workshop. But we will run as many workshops as are necessary. So don't feel that you're going to get left out or you're, you're going to miss the opportunity. We're going to do booking on a first come, first serve basis. Um, and the booking is th through that email address there, cpd at riai.ie. And I know Steph is going to post that. And I presume Ryan and Evelyn and TU Dublin and all, anyone else from any of the schools, if you need any information, um, just make sure you get in touch with us and we'll get everything over to you. And then there's four key things that you need to put in your booking. And if you don't have the four items, it the booking um, really can't be processed because... Uh, we need to just make sure that we're we're reaching the people that it's targeted to. So we need your name. This and it'll all be confidential. Nobody nobody'll get these lists. I won't even see this list. Nobody will see this list. It's just purely for booking. So it's your name, um, the name of your program and the year you're in. So if you're in architecture year two, you put BR year two or architect year one or whatever it is. Um, and that's again so we can just maybe extract some of that information and know where the, the sources of need are, where we might target future events, um, or we might just keep it general. And then we also need to know your school, um, which school you're coming from. And that's again, in case one of the schools doesn't um, appear for the first lot of workshops, we can make an effort to go and contact them directly. Maybe they might have heard about us and we wanna make sure everybody does. And then the fourth piece of information that you need to put is which workshop you would like to attend. So. As I say, the first two are next Wednesday and Thursday. The Wednesday one is from 3 to 5 p.m. And the Thursday one is from 11 to 1 p.m. And the plan is to run them exactly the same times and dates the following week. So the following Wednesday. So if you just put Wednesday or Thursday as your preference and you don't get next week, you will get the following week or the one after. But we'll prioritize you in a first come, first served. So I hope that's clear enough for everybody um, and not too complicated. Yeah, thanks.
Carol. Um, so I, I, I hope that, that if there are questions just about the specifics of that, um, maybe people might put them in the chat or just on mute and ask away. Um, I would just note maybe a couple of things. Firstly, that I, I believe it's the case in all schools, certainly in UCD and I, I imagine in the others. I mean, th this initiative is um, supported by staff, your teachers. Um, I mean, I've asked our staff to facilitate students who want to take part because sometimes I know that these workshops might coincide with taught sessions that you have or classes. So um, I, I know that that's the case in UCD and I, I can't say for sure. I mean, Jennifer, you might say in relation to TU, um, but that, as I say, we, we, we want to facilitate students in participating. Um, so that's there's that to say. Um, the other, maybe a couple of other things to note, I suppose, firstly, again, or sorry, uh, next thing to note would be that, as I mentioned at the start, in all of the universities and college, there are support there as well that you can avail of. There are student advisors and they are, there's other kinds of support services and they will also have a lot of links to support services. So I, th I believe that that information is also going to be collated as part of the workshop package so that there's there's information specific to each institution certainly we've been gathering that information um, and we'll be making it available uh, i know that julia marr is here for, as student advisor from ucd and 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 she would have equivalents i, in, I think in every um third level institution so um i think that's important for you guys to know as well um Am I missing anything else, Steph, that I should be saying? Uh, no, I think that's well. So I, I might just ask, how many people will be at each of the sessions? Like how many students will be accommodated each? I don't know. Did you say that? 30, that 30 of our sessions. Yeah, 30. 30 per session. Totally. Yeah, we, John, John Project felt that that was probably the best number. He's going to, as I said earlier on, there's going to be some social engagement at it and there'll be breakout rooms and different things. So um, that's, what, that's what he recommends. Now, if we only... For example, if we get only get 66 people applying, we'll run two sessions of 33 or whatever. Like we're not going to exclude people at, that, at any level. So, uh, but 30 is the recommended um, number. Yeah. yeah, I might ask as well. I know, I know that the sessions are two hours long. Um, I know, I know some people like myself included, if I'm sitting on Zoom for more than an hour, it's, it's a bit of a drag. And I wonder like, if, if somebody wants to come for the session, but they can't perhaps like make it through the whole thing, like, is, is that, is that possible or that impede things and make things awkward or? I think, I think John has designed them so that they will engage for two hours. He's been doing this for a long time and um, he's a lot of experience in running these type of workshops. And we did talk about that and we talked about, you know, delivering a series of shorter um, workshops. And he really felt strongly that this two hour workshop would be, would hold people's attention, the wrong word, but interest and I suppose enthusiasm and um, he felt it would be good. Obviously, if you're, if you're sitting in it, there's no obligation to sit to the end if it's not relevant to you, but I would encourage everybody to give it a go. Um, and we would love feedback from it. So if it's if if you would like it done differently, uh, please let us know because all what we really really want to do is is to try and you know help and improve the situation for people. And and if this workshop isn't doing that, then we'll we'll change it or we'll 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 find another person to deliver it or we'll redesign it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that sounds really good. Then I, I I imagine a lot of people who are here listening in would be interested in signing up and. As you said, we post these onto YouTube afterwards. So like, hopefully we'll get a good bit of engagement there. We'll spread it on, on Instagram and stuff as well. I might ask people as well, if, if you know, people who are listening in, if um, you have friends that are not here, but you think it would be relevant, uh, you might as well. I think the IBS have a couple of posts on their Instagram page that can be shared uh, just to spread the word about these and make sure that, um, you know, make sure that everybody knows, everybody that needs to know about this knows about it. So. 